Good morning. I have just a little over 10 minutes to cover quite a bit. After all, this is the whole wide world that most everyone spends all of their time on. And this, and this, and also this is the area that I'm covering today. And I will do my best. I will have to jump quickly and leave a few holes, but I assure you that the 40-plus years of the Space Studies Institute has filled in most of the gaps. And if you look to SSI.org and read or ask, you will be filled in too. When space folk hear the name SSI, their thoughts immediately go two places. One, to the images of our big, giant space colonies. And two, to the famous quote by our founder, is a planetary surface really the best place for an expanding technological civilization? Those images and that quote and the fast relationship that forms in the mind when the two are presented together leads some to believe that SSI is only about big, giant space colonies, which are impossible to be made in the real world unless they are made by evil, rich Elysium overlords. But I'm going to give you the nickel tour of the SSI High Frontier concept and ask you to give it some fair consideration. The Space Studies Institute was founded in 1977 by Gerard Kitchen O'Neill. He was a Princeton nuclear physicist, and in the year before Sputnik, he proposed a contraption called the Storage Ring Synchrotron. This was a revolutionary way to store energies and then precisely guide and direct beams of particles at each other in accelerators. It was strikingly more efficient than the shotgun and fixed target method that was the norm, but storage rings were not immediately accepted and loved. The scientific community decided that, theoretically, it might someday far in the future be maybe something to consider, but it was not possible to actually make such hardware in the real world. O'Neill calmly and quietly walked from the blackboard to the laboratory, and he built a working model, and he patented it. And it has been a foundational piece of technology used in most every high-energy lab and particle accelerator ever since. Teaching Princeton Physics 103, O'Neill chose for his students of the turbulent American 1960s, a breaking news topic that had the tarnish of big evil government, but the shiny of potential promise. Humans in space. Running the numbers, doing the focused research, but allowing students to add perspectives from economics to environmentalism, O'Neill and some of his students started to notice that humans living and working in space not a select few gods doing the same experiments over and over and over again, but regular people doing actual worthwhile living and working in a conducive environment was not a flight of fancy. It was a doable and practical option for helping to solve some of the frightening issues that any planet with a growing population will eventually face. Growing populations have growing needs. It is amazing that we live on a water planet and yet we're not able to get the water that we need. The salt, mineral, and water mixture in our bodies match the Paleozoic oceans that we came out of, but it is potable water that keeps our bodies and our agriculture and our industries alive. And converting the content of the seas into that usable version takes energy, specifically electrical energy, and lots of it. The production of industrial-level chemical fertilizer is also extremely dependent on energy. To produce it on an industrial scale large enough to actually make any difference to developing nations, they need more energy than they have. And the developing nations don't have the money to pay the current suppliers for it. We developed because when we had our industrial revolutions, energy was cheap. But those days are gone. Conservation and recycling only put off the inevitable. Bad things are on the horizon when people are starving and the supplies are too expensive and too limited and some new stock isn't being brought to the bar. In 1968, Dr. Peter Glazer invented the solar power satellite. Put a big truss at geosynchronous orbit where the communication satellites are, for a reason. Convert the sunlight to DC power using solar cells or a set of mirrors heating a liquid element to drive a turbine. 
Put that together with the proven work of Dr. Bill Brown of Raytheon Labs, and you beam the power down to Earth. It is not a death ray. The quantum values proposed are less than one forty thousandth that of the natural ultraviolet you get when you walk down the street on a sunny day. Add rectenna farms on the Earth and plug them into the grid. Daylight on the surface is not required because the satellites sit out of the shadows and work 24 hours a day. The Department of Energy and NASA and Boeing and, and, and have studied solar power satellites over and over, and study after study comes back saying it's not only possible, it's practical, it's doable, and it's been so since the 1980s. Except for one thing. The cost of lifting the dumb mass. Not the high-tech parts. Those only add up to 1 or 2 percent of the weight. It's the dumb support structures that simply cannot be lifted economically, even with all of Elon Musk's SpaceX work to reduce the cost to low Earth orbit. But that was covered, too, back in the 1970s. The key is using the mass of the moon and lifting it not with chemical rockets, but with hardware that O'Neill's SSI and MIT teams had built and proven— Mass drivers. When you say mass driver, there's usually someone thinking, oh, rail guns. But the mass driver is the creative father of the destructive rail gun. Think of a roller coaster ride. You wait in line, the car comes, you get in. The ride runs you around a circle and loops and then comes back and picks up the next batch of riders. The lunar mass driver works like that. Only its magnetic pulses bring the buckets of raw or pre-processed regolith up to thousands of Gs, then dip and slow, letting the mass continue on its trajectory away from the moon and up to a collection catcher that not only wrangles the small masses, but reuses some of their kinetic energy. Once enough mass is there, the best elements are processed for making solar cells and glass composites, and the remainder slag is melted and formed into structural components using nothing more high-tech than parabolic mirrors. Those components go into the manufacture of the solar power satellites and into the habitats that the workers on the solar power satellites may choose to live in. Why are they so big? People ask all the time. It must be impossible. But in space, big is not really an issue. In space, there is no limit except the limit of your raw materials, and we don't need to drag those up through the Earth's gravity well. The International Space Station is a cramped little habit trail because everything had to be dragged kicking and screaming to orbit. But does all this just move the rape of the environment from the Earth to the Moon? Compared to the terrible damage that a typical strip mine does to our living planet, the use of the Moon is ridiculously minor. O'Neill wrote this in 1988. When one first hears the phrase mining the moon, one thinks in terms of vast open pits, scores of giant machines, and a scale of operations comparable to our great terrestrial mines. The reality will be far more modest. If the surface is excavated even to the depth of a shallow gravel pit, and a million tons or more are removed every year, in several years of operation, the whole operation will still be so small that you could walk the length of it in a few minutes. Mining experts who have considered the problem consider the lunar mine to be so small scale that it will hardly keep one bulldozer occupied. The moon, our research concludes, will be a place where a small number of people will likely live. But it is not a great place for the human animal. One-sixth gravity may be fine for some extended periods. It may be a place where conception could occur. Or it may cause adaptations that will make returning to Earth for holidays very strenuous, if not fatal. May. We don't know for sure. And no space agency in the world has done a lick of direct testing because accurate testing of the effects of various low gravities simply cannot be done in the 1G gravitational influence of the Earth. And while it has been exciting to consider how to use all of those lava tubes on the moon that should fully protect from galactic cosmic radiation and extreme solar events, hiding underground, plus the low gravity, don't add up to places that a whole lot of folks will choose to call home. 
Plus, there's the practical manufacturing side. That one-sixth gravity appears to not be enough to let the human animal continue its expected course, and yet it is too much to allow us to get the benefits of the chemical and materials processing that a zero-g environment offers. Getting the raw materials from the moon is the right idea. Processing them off of the moon has been found by decades of research to be the most effective plan in the long term. And those big colonies allow the choice of gravities. Outside is zero. And as you move along the inner slopes perpendicular to the spin, you go from one to nearly zero. And the lunar slag shells do the same radiation protection. So we still lean toward the O'Neill colonies for places where you don't need to bribe with hazard and combat pay to get people to take up residence. Plus, the mass drivers and their infrastructure are only one and a third light seconds away from the surface of the Earth, which is an easy distance for lunar teleoperations. Again, something that has been tested extensively over the years. We are not saying don't go. We're saying that the ramifications of scratching and clawing your way out of a gravity well just to climb back down another gravity well, and the very heavy equipment and massive amounts of chemical fuel that it takes to do that, is something to give due diligence. As are those giant space colonies, and the reasons for them. In 2075, will we have the choice of feeding our growing billions? Will we still be paying dearly for potable water and paying the devil of inefficiency to heat and power our homes and our businesses and all our coal-powered electric cars? Will our underdeveloped nations still be the places of fear and imbalance, fear born out of the need to survive, the need to grow beyond mere survival, but the imbalance of energy and resources to do so? It doesn't have to be this way. There truly are no limits to growth. The question has never actually been whether the high frontier concept, using the unlimited energy and resources of space to benefit life on Earth, is a viable idea. The question has always been, when will the individuals who now know that they can play a part in doing this personally pitch in? So that in 2075, everyone won't look back and wonder why we here today made the choice to call the obvious impossible. This is Earth. And everything that the people of Earth could ever need is available to all of us. Space is just eight minutes away. And that is the SSI High Frontier Concept.